110 years on from 1914. It's history repeating itself. One of the things I want to talk about is how real is the danger of history repeating itself? What were the causes in 1914? What are the causes of the danger now? And later, perhaps in another video, I'll discuss how we should react politically to this. Back in 1914, there had been a process of formation of blocks. One block was the Central Powers, shown in red here. The other was the Triple, triple Entente and its allies. Now, there were alliances before 1914 between Italy and the Central Powers, but in the end Italy plumped for the Triple Entente. Now look at the analogous situation today. There is a new anti-NATO group of states that I've shown in red here. And there is what I'm calling the super NATO because it includes Australia and Japan, which are obviously not part of the North Atlantic. And we have this similar formation of hostile blocks. And there's open discussion of warfare. I've photocopied yesterday's headline in one of the leading British papers that the UK has three years to get ready for war. You can scarcely get a more bellicose statement than that. But there's a difference between preparing and starting a war. There's no doubt that the blocs are preparing for war. But during the Cold War, NATO and the Warsaw Pact also prepared for war, but open war didn't break out. But proxy wars did. There were proxy wars in Korea and Vietnam. And there are proxy wars taking place now in Ukraine and between Gaza and in Gaza, Lebanon and now um, the Yemen. Now, what's the difference between a proxy war and a, a full war? Well, proxy wars are a new phenomenon. They're a phenomenon of the nuclear age, where great powers are reluctant to openly go to war with one another because of the risks. And it's a proxy war if you, there are two nuclear powers, each supporting an opposite side, and at most one of those powers openly commits troops. So the USA openly committed troops in Korea and Vietnam. But the USSR didn't openly commit troops in either of them. There were Soviet volunteers serving in Vietnam, in Korea, but that's not the same thing. And in the Korean War, Chinese and US troops fought directly. But at that point, China was not a nuclear power. It was at most a proxy for the Soviet Union in that sense. Obviously, open conflict between China and the USA today would be an altogether different matter. Now let's look at the world in 1900 in order to get a perspective on what led up to the First World War. And I have coloured in the British Empire red, the French Empire purple, and the Russian Empire is in blue here. Now some co confusion because Portugal is also in blue, but this is the Russian Empire. The Portuguese colonies shouldn't count there. Now, the population figures will be surprising compared to the pro present day. The largest state by area and population was the British Empire, followed by China, 
then by Russia, then the USA, then the French Empire, and then the German Empire. Now that's a rather different situation from today. China's obviously up at the top still. In 1900, the German ruling class saw a world dominated by empires. And these empires were much bigger in population and area than the German Empire. These empires not only provided manpower for armies and potentially for industries, but their areas provided key resources. And I'll look into that next. China was seen as a future threat, and this is very clear in the Kaiser's speech to German troops departing to China. But in the immediate period, the risk of competition was with three great empires, Britain, Russia, and the USA. And the USA was a continental empire, an empire which had spread from the East Coast over the last century to cover the whole of uh, it, the, what's now the continental USA. Now, there were resources involved. First of these is food. England and Germany were not self-sufficient in food. Their populations had risen rapidly during industrialization, and agricultural production, domestic agricultural production, had lagged. Britain had temperate colonies in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And these were major English food sources. From the point of view of the German ruling class, they felt that if Ukraine could become conquered, it would be Germany's Canada and would provide a secure f source of food that Britain had from Canada. Next item is mineral resources. Although Germany was a significantly larger steel producer than Britain, second only to the United States, it was heavily dependent on imported mineral resources. And this is a graph produced by the US Geological Survey at the time. And it shows the extent to which Germany was dependent on imported iron ore from France. This is the total German consumption of iron ore from the Lorraine districts. And the growth of German steel production from 1900 to 1913 had been almost entirely dependent on importing iron ore. German production leaving out imports is this low line at the bottom. So to become the world's second largest steel producer, Germany depended on imports from Belgium, Luxembourg and France. Imports of, of iron ore. A war aim of the German industrial bourgeoisie was to annex the coal fields and iron fields of northern France and Belgium. These are the Lorraine iron fields on which the German steel industry was heavily dependent. They had part of the Saar coal field themselves and they did annexed in the war with um, 1870, they'd annexed part of Alsace-Lorraine. So they had some of that, but around Metz. But these were important war, sorry, important war objectives. They also wanted the, the resources of Silesia and in the long term, the Caspian oil fields. So they wanted the wheat-growing areas of Russia, the oil-producing areas of Russia, and 
the oil, sorry, iron and coal fields of northern France. And these were the areas that Germany planned to annex. They were able to get a large part of that in the Treaty of brest litovsk in 1918, when they essentially got the land in Ukraine that they wanted. So the objective of securing grain producing colonies had been achieved by the start of 1918. And if you look at the areas that NATO aims to include now, these substantially overlap with those that the central powers wish to uh, seize in, in the 1914-18 war. Now this is not all just made up, this is actually from German government documents, it's quite, these b became available in the 1960s, they were published, and this is the, their Chancellor's uh, memo of what the war aims were. The military to decide whether we should demand the cessation of Belfort and the western slopes of the Vosges. The raising of fortresses and cession of the coastal strip from Dunkirk to Beloy. The ore field of Briery, which is necessary for the supply of iron ore to our industry, to be ceded in any case. Further, a commercial treaty, which makes France economically dependent on Germany, secures the French market for our exports and makes it possible to exclude British commerce from France. This treaty must secure for us financial and industrial freedom of movement in France in such a fashion that German enterprises can no longer receive different treatment from the French. We must create a central European economic association through common customs treaties to include France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Austria-Hungary, Poland and perhaps Italy, Sweden and Norway. This association will, will not have any common constitutional authority and its members will be formally equal but in practice will be under German leadership and must stabilise German economic dominance over Middle Europe. Now, if you look at the current map of the EU, those objectives of German industry had largely been met. Key step in that goes back to 1951, when the European Coal and Steel Community was established, which gave the German steel industry access to the French and Belgian mineral deposits that had been a war aim in the two world wars. That was the precondition, essential precondition, for Germany no longer having territorial claims over Belgium and France. Now, another motive for empire was emigration. I've talked about food and mineral resources. There was a desire to encourage the emigration of the poor. And this has to be understood in the context of class polarization. Back in the 19th century, Australia was England's Siberia. It was a place to which the rebellious or dangerous elements of the working class could be exiled to become forced labourers. Now, obviously, Russia had Siberia for that. Later on, emigration became voluntary, didn't depend on forced labour, but the political objective remained the same right down through to the 1920s. Reduce the potentially rebellious working class as, pos uh, to as much as possible and transform them where possible into loyal farmers in the colonies. So this was a constant theme in Britain to encourage emigration to the colonies of those who might be sources of dissent. And conservative views in Germany were the same. They would 
aim for settler colonialism in what's now Ukraine and the Belarus. We know that that failed, but the motivations were the same. When war broke out, it was eventually decided by industrial supremacy. It turned out to depend enormously on the ability to mass produce weapons. This is a, a photo from a British shell factory around 1917. As far as the eye can see, piles of shells stretched out with machinery to move them. The winners were determined by industrial capacity. This is a table taken from Paul Kennedy's Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which shows the steel production of different nations. And it's interesting that British steel production peaked in 1890, uh, hadn't recovered that by 1913. Um, the United States was growing rapidly. Germany grew rapidly, but as I said, it depended on French iron ore. If you look at the combined industrial capacity of the Central Powers versus the Triple Entente, the Central Powers had a m minor lead. The industrial capacity of Britain, France and Russia roughly equaled that of Germany. But when you throw in Austro-Hungary, then there was a minor advantage on the part of um, Germany. But the loss or non-availability of French iron ore, followed by American intervention, produced a three-to-one disparity against the Central Powers, and eventually they lost. This was an inevitable result of industrial comparative industrial weakness. But the fact that the two groups were so closely matched, that they were very close in steel production at the start, meant that the war could last for a, lot, a long time before attrition determined things. For reading on this period, the, these are some books, because I am often asked to recommend um, books for my videos. Obviously Lenin's imperialism written during the war, but uh, work by a number of historians. The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers by Kennedy, which I've cited. Also The War Plans of the Great Powers by Kennedy. And the work of the great German historian Fischer, translated into English as Germany's Aims in the First World War. I've also relied on a, an analysis by U.S. Geological Survey in 1920 on the iron and associated industries of Lorraine, which shows the dependence of Germany on French ore. Now, what's different now? Well, there's a reason I sh start with a photo of a field. Mechanised agriculture with artificial fertilisers and better varieties of pest control, etc., have drastically raised domestic food production within the European Union. So the motivation to conquer land for food has been removed. The EU is self-sufficient in food. And obviously... The US and Russia never had this, this um, motivation. Land for settlement is no longer an issue. The birth rates in all the leading capitalist powers have plummeted to, in most cases, either below or just at reproduction rates. So there is no issue of acquiring colonies for settlement, with the exception of Israel, which is a settler colony, but it's not a settler colony driven by overpopulation in the United States. Minerals, however, remain a source of contention. 
Oil is now the critical resource, not coal, and it's subject to great power competition. You can't understand US involvement in the Middle East outside of the context of oil production. At one point, back in the 70s, the aim was to ensure US imports of oil. But since fracking, the US no longer depends on oil imports. But it still has two key reasons for being interested in the Middle East. One is that oil revenue from the Gulf props up, or for a long time served to prop up the dollar. And secondly, the US wants to be able to cut off oil to China in the event of conflict. So it's important for them to have strong relationship with the oil producing states such that come to conflict they have bases there which they could use to cut off oil supplies to China. Now, as I say, since the development of fracking, the US has been self-sufficient in oil and also a major producer of gas. And since that happened, it has aimed to cut off Russian gas from the European market and replace it with high cost but more profitable for the US supplies of fracked gas. And it is almost certain that the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline a couple of years ago was done by US naval forces, secretly done by US naval forces. Uh, Hirsch says that um, Norwegian forces were involved as well. but. Uh, whether it was just the um, Americans, whether it was Norwegians or Americans and British, is, doesn't matter here. Why were they doing this? Well, firstly, it gave US gas companies a new market. Secondly, they saw it as a way of cutting off foreign exchange revenue to w Russia, their major rival. Thirdly, a major economic rival, Germany, would now face higher costs, removing it as an industrial competitor, so that German firms would have a, an incentive to move their production base from Germany itself and invest in the US, furthering the aims of boosting US industry. Now, you have to look at the situation of US industry and US industrial production over the last hundred years. Well, I'm showing more than a hundred years here. For the period up until the mid-1870s, the US ran a trade deficit and was importing capital goods, importing means of production from Britain and Europe and relied on capital inflows from Europe to finance that. From the last quarter of the 19th century, the US became a trade surplus nation. This is the middle period here. During that period, it could export capital and became the world's main creditor. During the First World War, Britain relied on American credit. During the Second World War, Britain relied on American credit. During the period between the two wars, Germany relied on American credit to be able to pay off reparations. In the period after the Second World War, the US trade surplus was used to finance the export of capital which led to the establishment of US subsidiaries all over the world. Subsidiaries of big US firms like General Motors and Ford were established across the world. From 1970, it has been running a deficit, which became huge. In other words, it's not been able to pay its way in the world, and it has relied on borrowing. It's been able to do this because 
from the 1970s, for the first time in history, there was no gold standard operating. At the time, up until then, all currency systems had been based on gold. Since then, the dollar system is not gold-based and has relied on pressure by the US for states like Saudi Arabia initially, but later other states, to deposit their foreign reserves in the form of US Treasury bills or investments in the US. So protection of the dollar financial system then became a key driver. In the period up until Nixon, the US was interested in protecting its foreign investments. And that could be seen as a motivation for most of its foreign interventions. Since then, its objective has been to maintain its financial position as a debtor nation that depends on the constant recycling of dollars. We can see that the main states that form the core of the NATO bloc, the United States, the United Kingdom, France and Japan, are huge deficit states. India is also a deficit state. India and Turkey are deficit states, but their position in, in the world lineup is not so clear. But even Japan is now a deficit state. The surplus states, on the other hand, this is before the breakout of the Ukraine war. The surplus states were China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Norway, Australia, Qatar, etc. The only major NATO-aligned powers that were surplus are Germany, Australia and Norway. And Norway hardly counts as a major power. So Australia and Germany, perhaps. The US deficit is now so big that it could no longer solely rely on deposits of dollars by the Gulf states to finance it. The problem was that the main potential sources of funds were nations that were aligned militarily against it, China and Russia. Hence, we see, over the last year or two, increasing pressure for the open conversation of Russian foreign exchange assets. Now, it's made out that this is going to be for aid to Ukraine, but in practice, the money will nominally go to Ukraine, but in, in practice will be spent in the US on US weapon systems, so it'll flow into the US economy. What the Ukraine war has shown is that we've had a reversion to World War I type of fighting. And as we saw, in that kind of attritional warfare, industrial capacity is decisive. The Western militaries are aware that they're not prepared for that. They thought in 1922, before the war broke out, that they had clear superiority. The way the war has developed has taught them, no, they don't, that their technical advantage has been significantly eroded. They lack industrial capacity to produce weapons at a large scale. And if you read the article by in the Independent there, or the I, the, they know their training is outdated. Their training for wars as they thought they were in their experience in fighting Iraq and countries like that. And Britain and Germany say that they'll be ready for a war in either three or five years. This seems hopelessly optimistic from their point of view. Well, obviously, we hope there isn't a war, but 
there is a division within the oh I'm sorry I've missed out this if you look at capacity to produce things and I'm giving the equivalent data to the data I gave for 1913 looking at steel capacities now obviously these figures are vastly greater than they were in 1913 um, Iran now produces as much steel as the US did in 1913 Brazil does and if you look at the BRICS nations Brazil India Russia China and Iran which is effectively aligned with them they vastly outproduce Germany South Korea United States and Japan which are the main industrial nations in the NATO coalition well we include Italy there perhaps Turkey and India are, are probably not reliable allies of either side just as Italy wasn't in 1913 but even if we leave them out the BRICS nations have far more industrial capacity than the NATO nations and this is not something that is fully realized by the ruling classes until the Ukraine war showed this and there's a division within the ruling classes a wing associated with the state machine and finance capital is more aggressive and has been unrealistic about the actual limitations they face in the US this wing has been associated with the Democrat Party and has been pushing for war with Russia essentially for pu pushing for proxy war with Russia and stepping it up stepping up the Ukraine war another wing which is probably now represented by Trump and Vance sees its first aim as to reindustrialize the US economy and deal with the trade deficit both to get a, a full full employment in the US but also to put them in a position to conflict with China now neither of those is a party for long-term peace the one is pushing for conflict in the short term with either Russia or Iran and the other is pushing for a conflict in the long term with China now if the Trump wing were to win and if the policy of reindustrialization were to be pursued then obviously it has an impact on the whole internal class balance of these countries because the neoliberal politics that has gone on since the end of the 1970s has been dependent on the decline of the industrial working class as a domestic constituency within Britain the US and to a lesser extent Germany so should reindustrialization actually become a policy and should it occur then there will be changes in the class balance of forces within the country it will be a, a turning back of the cut back of the working class that Thatcher and Reagan organized they will realize that they're dependent on having an industrial base within the country which changes the local balance of class forces and there is little chance of them being able to overtake China so there may be a long period during which there is competition to increase 
industrial production between the two states, two state blocks.